thanks a lot and good and good morning. I'm feeling a bit tired after last the last kind of night's fun. So I'm here from the Smithsonian, um, and I uh, work here at this, this museum. This museum is perhaps one of the hidden kind of treasures in the Smithsonian's port portfolio of museums. We're in kind of New York, and we're in this old house that reopened after a three-year closure uh, in December 2014. This, this was Carnegie's house, and it came to the Smith, uh, Smithsonian in um, the 1970s, and the collection dates, dates back to the early 20th century. So we've been doing a minor renovation, <laughs> reconstructing the entire building, and in reconstructing the building, we also re rethought the purpose the mission and the way the experience of this building would be delivered to the hopefully new kind of visitors we would attract. And we re rest restored it by hand in many cases. This is the teak, teak room. Um, but it's still pretty small. We added um, about 60% six, more gallery space. But this is the sort of kind of muse museum that, 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 that in the past people on Yelp people on Trip, TripAdvisor would say, it's probably about a 45 kind of minute, ex minute experience. And I should also point out that we are the one Smithsonian unit that charges admission. So that's kind of a different way of thinking about things in New York. Um, so we have an interesting collection. We have a series of bird cages from the early, 20th century, uh, the early 19th century. Actually, some of the first pieces in the, the collection are these bird, bird ca cages. Lots and lots of buttons, uh, wallpapers, which are important, uh, as you'll see later on, te textiles, cricket ca cages. So not only birds, but people kept crickets as pets, um, and lots and lots of porcelain animals some of which are really cool. <laughs> so this one is the one that my team calls the spanking cat, um, which of course is the ma mascot for my you know, digital team that is there to disrupt and innovate. Anyway, um, so before the museum closed, there was a series of pre press pieces that really started to point out the challenges of bringing this collection and its relevance to the 21st century. Because we also have an amazing collection of uh, con um, con uh, contemporary design, so posters, products, and increasingly software. This is a piece that my, my team acquired for the collection. It's, it's actually an, um, um, an app, and it was the first app any, um, um, any Smith, uh, Smithsonian Museum had added to its, to its collection. Also, we're starting to see soft software and code become physical thing, things. So here's a 3D print, print, printed vase that's in our collection from a British cer ceramicist acquired in 2013. Now, my team acquired alongside this, this, this piece the source code for it, so the way that vase was made. So this is sort of the beginning as of the collection beginning to shift as well as the building beginning to shift. So we have a lot of stuff. We really have a lot of things. And of course, in the modern age, all of this, all of the images of these pieces would of course be on the web freely available. So in reopening the, um, the, um, the museum, we needed a way to physically assert, uh, to, to assert the importance of physically visiting the museum when in fact you could and should be able, be able, be able to see all of this stuff from home or from school. So the building. So the building is now reno renovated, and it looks a, looks, a, looks a little bit like this. So this is our foyer, foyer space and one of our gallery spaces. And this, for many, aud or, um, um, for many audiences, has a kind of threshold fear. We talk about threshold, threshold fear a lot in, um, the, in um, the museum world, because in the 19th century, muse museums were built with these enormous columns, and they were these physically imposing buildings. But this threshold fear keeps out many audiences that should own the, these places. This is what Michelle Obama said when she launched the Whitney. You know, these, this threshold fear keeps out the very audiences that these museums, particularly the Smithsonian museums, are there to serve. So, 
in thinking about what success for the museum, a reopened museum, would look, look like, my team thought about these, 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 these kind of goals. In, 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 increased visitor diversity, having people spend more time on our site. So 45 minutes for an 18 kind of dollar, dollar admission charge, you know, it's a bit tough. So could, could we extend that out? Could we keep visitors satis satis satisfied? And importantly for us, could, could we get them back? And to do that, we would need to have innovation internally to the building, which would, have, would generate a new capacity to collect and exhibit the present as much as the past. So how, how kind of might we exhibit soft, soft software and code alongside uh, things from the early 19th, 18th, uh, cent, you know, cent, uh, centuries. So of course we would roll out a city citywide campaign to, to to tell tell people that we'd reopened or launched in many ways. And this this was a geo-targeted you know campaign around the city. So this is from uh, Williamsburg to tell people that they needed to come to the Upper East Side to see this new thing. But in fact, it was the experience that would become the way we got repeat visitation. And word of, uh, word of kind of mouth was, was really going to be the sustainable key uh, method of marketing for us. So experience, user experience became the differentiator. So thinking about user experience, technology was going to be key. And the te technology uh, challenge we posed to ourselves, as well as the 13 design firms we worked with, was this. We needed to break that threshold fear. As soon as, as, soon as people came into the door and give kind of visitors explicit permission to play and to behave in different ways, in ways perhaps they didn't think they were allowed to behave in such an ornate build building. And because they, they would come in groups, pairs, families, we needed to make, make sure that those interactive experiences that they, that they would have were not solitary ones. They needed to afford a sociality. We needed to help visitors record and remember what, what they did. And in short, it was a look-up experience. Remember, we're quite a small building physically, and the last kind of thing we wanted was people staring at their, their phones in a solitary experience. And to make it work, this would need to be ubiquitous. It needed to be a thing that everybody got. Because we knew that technology, once it was rolled out within the, the building, would change the way visitors behaved. And we needed an opinion on what our preferred method of people engaging with us was. So local projects, a firm in kind of New York, came up with this idea of, well, you're a designed museum, so why not give everybody a pen? And that pen would allow, would allow people and, and encourage people to create and record what, what they did. And it would get, get you away from your phone and, in, and, and in, their, in their words, bring you closer to design itself. So the, the pen had a, func a functional role, but it also worked in a different way and communicated to visitors that this wasn't a um, kind of museum of art, which was about looking at art, but it was a designed museum. And design is about doing things, not only looking at things. And interestingly, this fits our na narrative stretching back to the early 20th century. Because in the early 20th century, this is a, this is a photo from, 19, from the 1920s when the collection was housed at the Cooper Union. And you can see here people using the collection to, in, to, to be inspired and create new things from. And it's not an app, right? Importantly, it's not an app. So what did, what did we do? We worked, worked with, a, with a whole bunch of firms, GE, Sestel, a firm in Spain, and Make, make, make Simply, to build this um, device from scratch. Um, and what's changed when I started working on the web about 20 years ago, um, we are at a similar stage with physical products that we, we were at with um, the web in 95, 96, which is very exciting. So this was supported by you know, Bloomberg Philanthropies, and, and, and this is what I've called venture philanthropy. This is a way of think, think, thinking about and uh, su supporting risk. 
So product number design sprint with GE ended up in this. Uh, this is a, a video that plays as visitors come into the door. And it communicates to visitors that this pen that you, you get uh, is a thing that you use to collect things from around the museum and explore on tab tables throughout the museum and importantly is connected to your ticket. So this means that when you go home, you can log, log, log in and see all of the things you have collected and made. And so visitors come up to the uh, labels in the museum and they physically press those kind of labels. The pen vibrates, which helps them remember and select things, makes it more, in, more intentional than just photography. And because it has no screen, it is very com you know, comfortable for the eight kind of year, year old as much as the 78 year old to, to use. And this is uh, the big interactive table, so very social, ex social experience, like a shared, shared coffee table experience in a cafe. People can use the, the, the pen to just search, search by drawing lines and shapes. They can explore things in our collection that are on show as well as things that are not on show. Um, they can walk around the galleries and here we have somebody collecting this phone, vibrates, lights up, they come back to the tab tables, they connect it and the phone is there for them to, ex to, ex to, ex to explore. Because they've got the other end of the, the, the pen and we're a design museum, you can design and make three, three, three D things. So here's people drawing a tab table uh, drawing a vase, a lamp, and because the pen is connected to their ticket, they can save all of those to take, take away later. And so it's, very, it's a very playful way of uh, ex um, 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 exploring the museum's wealth. Um, we've given out a lot of pens. So we have 3,000 pens that we cycle um, through. We've given them out 64,000 times in roughly 500 months which represents 94% of our visitors. And those pens have collected a lot of things. Nearly one and a half million pieces from our collection have been collected by, by those pens. The most popular is this paper cut, uh, Noah's Ark paper cut from 1982. This was hidden away on our second, second floor. So people are making really intentional choices about the things they save which have surprised us and are, give, and, and are giving us new learnings about the things visitors, new, new visitors that we're getting are curious about. So I mentioned wallpapers. We have the largest collection of wallpapers in North America, but wallpapers are kind of hard to show. And when in that same piece, you know, <laughs> wallpapers, how can you make these exciting? for people in the 21st century. Well, as it turns out, with a pen, you can make lots of things exciting. So, so we created this, this immersion room, which is a floor-to-ceiling you know, pro, uh, projection space, where people, have, people can create and draw their own wall, wall, wallpapers and can make amazing designs themselves. They can also, of course, browse the, his, browse the collection of wallpapers that we have and see those projected at full scale within um, the museum. And here, uh, interp um, uh, um, interpretation of those wall wallpapers. They can pinch and zoom those. And this has become an incredibly social experience. And it's an experience that cannot be replicated at home. This is one of my fav favorite ones, the bacon and egg <laughs> wallpaper, right? <laughs> and because it's this projection space, visitors take ownership and they picture themselves in the museum. And we have so, so, so many museum selfies taken in this space. It is unbelievable. There you go, the bacon and eggs. 56,000 designs have been saved by visitors and shared. And this is people taking ownership of the museum. This is a publicly owned museum. And this is um, the public asserting that they own it. And the dwell times have gone up to more than an hour and a half. The space has increased a little bit, but we've given people things to, you know, to do. And we can measure it because we give the pens out at the start of the visit and we get them back at the end of the visit. So when kind of you go home, you log into your ticket created with Tessitura, and we get 
over a third of all our ticket hold holders log back into their visit. And they can see all the things that they have collected and all the things that they have created. And they can see detailed text and videos about the works that they have created later on. And those designs that they have made are available not only as an image, but as vector shapes and 3D models, which means if you've created a vase or a chair or those, or those kinds of things on the tables, you can actually print them out on a 3D printer. And so, every, so all of the things that we have on show are online, include, 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 including all the ex exhibition text, all the videos are online, relicensed for the web. And this is making the museum part of the, in, the, in, the internet, not just putting it on the internet. And this is all built on the philosophy of the web and an API built, built in house that sits on um, top of both our collection database and Tessitura, our customer database. And de 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 delivers these experiences through, through um, uh, web, kind of, web kind of protocols to the experiences in the gallery and the pen itself. So this is the web as the core of the museum. It's version one and it's a platform we are building on and it's people rather than tech, tech, technology that makes it work. This is a lovely piece uh, quote from a uh, visitor who was talking about the security guards encouraging them and helping them with the pen and all, of the inter uh, and all of the interactive experiences. And it's the people in um, the museum, the front of house staff and the security guards that have made um, this work. So the Cooper Hewitt has become more than a mission, a collection and a build building. It is now really a mission, a collection and an experience that is de delivered through media and through the building itself. And in the New Yorker, this review summed it up by, by saying, finally, the mansion, this ornate mansion, now works for all ages. So thanks a lot. <laughs>